it is good for us to be here Praise the Lord And it's good to sing His praises Good morning, everyone, and welcome from the Central Oconee Church of Christ. Glad to have you with us this morning, even if it is virtually, but we do thank the Lord for giving us this avenue. And we hope that you had a great week last week and are looking forward to a great Lord's Day today. Last Sunday, I started talking about the meeting between Jesus and the woman at the well in Samaria. This morning, I wanted to continue that, but let's back up just a little bit to talk about what we covered last week. First of all, the background was that there's a great deal of enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans, but that did not matter to Jesus, although it did matter to the woman in the very beginning. Some of the points we covered were these. He needed to go through Samaria. The scripture tells us that he needed to be there. Now, according to the Jews, there was no need to go through Samaria, but Jesus went out of his way to have this encounter with this woman. We know that he needed rest. It tells us that he was tired and he sat down to rest. We know that he needed water. Give me a drink, he said to the woman. And in that, he proved to this woman that no one is beneath him. No one is so far below him that they don't need him. We know that Jesus needed to tell this woman that she was important. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is speaking to you, you would have asked and he'd have given you living waters. And when she heard that, she said, give me this water that I don't have to come to this well anymore. And we know that Jesus needed to touch her heart. He brought to her mind all those things in her life that were hanging on her shoulders, the things that were a burden to her. Now, she tried to deflect the question when Jesus asked her about those things, but Jesus was able to lovingly guide her back in the direction of the truth. And the truth was that he was the Messiah. The woman was overcome with joy or or wonder or excitement, or maybe all three when she heard that news. She left her water pot, she went into town, she got her friends and came back. And what about Jesus? Well, he never got the water. We do know that. And that's where we're going to pick up this week in John chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 26 through 28 to begin with. And we'll start right where we ended last week. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, Who do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Now here's a point to consider. The appearance of the disciples is tucked between some action. Basically, what happens is Jesus tells the woman that he's the Messiah. That's when the disciples walk up. Immediately after that, the woman leaves her water pot and goes away. Have you ever been talking to someone and have some, and had somebody come up and interrupt your conversation? And this was an important conversation. Maybe you were having a breakthrough with your son or daughter, or maybe you were having a breakthrough with a friend or a coworker at, at your place of employment, and someone came and butted into your conversation. It happens all the time. Well, the woman had just been told a startling fact. The Messiah was standing in front of her. And suddenly more men appeared, Jewish men. They were obviously confused at the situation, but to their credit, they didn't say anything right then. They were standing on the periphery of the conversation, maybe waiting for a break so they could say something. Every indication is that they may have just been staring at Jesus and this woman. But then the woman leaves. And I believe that she had every intention of coming back because she left her water pot. As she leaves, the situation is kind of diffused for the disciples. Instead of asking questions about what was going on, though, they said to Jesus, why don't you eat? We brought the food. Eat. And that's where we're going to pick up the passage right here. And we're going to go to John chapter 4, verses 31 through 34. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has someone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I remember a Charlie Brown cartoon once where Linus and Lucy were standing at the baseball field and they looked at Charlie Brown and Linus said, I believe he'd rather manage than eat. So Lucy walked over and offered Charlie Brown a snack and he looked at her and said, No thanks, I'd rather manage. 
Lucy walked back to Linus and said, You're right. <laughs> it's nice to have a sister agree with you for once, isn't it? In essence, that's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Jesus never got the water, and he was too busy thinking about the Samaritan woman to worry about food. But he uses that analogy for the disciples. My food, my nourishment, what fills my soul up, what energizes me, is to do the will of him who sent me, God and to finish his work. Now remember, this is very early in his ministry. We don't know what he's been telling them other than what's mentioned in chapters uh, 1, 2, and 3 of John. But we do know that he's trying to help them understand that there is a wider mission. And he's also trying to help them learn to focus on what's really important. So he gives them another analogy, and we'll pick pick up with verses 35 through 38. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. You know, I've been come, going down to uh, Central Oconee for nine years now, and there are cotton fields around uh, the building, and in, in certain areas around the building. Every year, I get to see how the fields are planted. I get to see how they begin to grow. Uh, the green pops up, the field becomes green, and then it becomes white. That's how it sounds when it becomes white. <laughs> No. Anyway, that you know, it becomes white. And when I look at that, I think it's time to harvest. But the farmer knows when it is time to harvest. And it's actually a little bit later than I think. Well, Jesus evokes the image of the field and how we look at that field and anticipate the harvest. Just four months and that crop is going to be ready. We'll be able to pick that crop and we'll be able to get that food or the cotton as it is. And that's the image for them to lock on to the greening of the fields. Then he tries to get them to focus on another harvest. Lift up your eyes. Open your eyes, he says. Remember, the scripture says that he needed to go through Samaria. Perhaps he was trying to drive home a point to the disciples at this point. Look around you. Here's the real harvest. Here's the crop that God cares about. These people. This field is ripe for harvest. Put aside all those things that separate you and understand that God loves these people as much as I do. In one of his Proverbs, Solomon said, the labor of the righteous leads to life, the wages of the wicked to sin. That's Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 16. In this passage, Jesus states that everyone who labors in this field gathers wages and fruit for eternal life. What Jesus is saying is close to what uh, Solomon was saying in Proverbs. Laboring in the fields is worthy of wages. Now, we know that, according to Paul, the wages of sin is death. But what are the wages of doing good? Well, there are two thoughts. First, it could be that something is awaiting us on the other side of this life, even more than just heaven itself, something that we'll enjoy in eternal life. It could be the joy of knowing that we did what the Lord asked us to do, or it could be the joy of seeing in heaven that person that we reached. Secondly, in this passage, Jesus says that we'll be rejoicing with that soul that's harvested for the Lord. Now, grab that We'll be rejoicing with that person. That means that we'll be sharing in the, with that person in this life the knowledge that they have hate, heaven waiting for them because they responded to the gospel call. Next, Jesus tells the disciples that he's sending them into a field that has already been prepared, a field that's been turned just like those cotton fields that I see down in Watkinsville. Remember that those Samaritans, those despised by the Jews, did have a common background. Their field had been turned. Part of the softening of the soil had been done by the writings of Moses. They knew that the Messiah was coming. They may have even heard John the Baptist. We don't know. They may have heard his message somehow. Now, one of them had heard the Messiah himself, and soon many more would. But they needed more. And there was only one way that they were going to get it, and that was by having laborers in the field. Shortly after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was a very busy man. In Matthew 9, we, it talks about how he was healing people and teaching people. And at the end of the chapter, we read this. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's interesting that in all these verses, there's one thing mentioned that many people get really upset about. Labor. No, we're not going to earn our way to heaven by laboring at good works, but we do have to do them. And the main area of work is in the fields. After Jesus talks to the disciples about this, the people from the village come to him. The Greek word that's used here for fields is chora, which means ground, which is plowed or cultivated. Jesus has laid the groundwork, though they didn't know that he had, but they were about to find out. So let's look at John chapter 4, and starting in verse 39 and going through 43. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. Imagine how the disciples must have felt. Not only walking through Samaria, but now having to stay there for two days. They were being brought into the mustness of Jesus' mission. Remember I talked last week about Jesus must do these things. I must teach. I must teach everyone. It wasn't just the Samaritan woman that was being evangelized. It wasn't the Samaritans that were being evangelized there in that little village of Sychar. It was the disciples. To evangelize means to spread good news. In our case, it's to teach the gospel, the good news of Jesus. One element of that good news is that God loves everyone, including Samaritans. Those disciples were learning the gospel is a message of love for everyone. They were learning how to be workers in the field, how to recognize and foster opportunities regardless of the field. And they were learning from the master. They spent two days in Sychar. John said that many believed. So yes, as Jesus had said, the field was really white to harvest. To harvest. I want to ask you something for just a moment, and I want you to think about this. It won't be hard for you, so it's okay. Think about a place that you do not like to go. Maybe it's a town you don't like, or maybe it's a restaurant, or maybe it's someplace else. Now answer this question. Why do you not like to go there? Is it the atmosphere? Is it the people there? Is it the food? Is it the smell? It is, is it fear? Now, here's another question. What would it take to make you happier in that place? Would you do it for money? Would you do it for a friend? We pick and choose the places that we want to go. We pick and choose the situations we want to be in. But in regard to that, when we look at the event in John chapter 4, we have to think of one very important point. The only person who was comfortable in that whole situation was Jesus. The woman was uncomfortable having a Jewish man at the well, then asking her questions, asking her for a drink. She was uncomfortable having her life stripped away, but she was willing to listen. She was willing to hear, and she was willing to tell others. The disciples, I'm sure, were uncomfortable being in Samaria. I'm sure they wanted to get through this area as quickly as possible. I know it was uncomfortable for, uncomfortable for them to see Jesus talking to a woman, to a Samaritan woman, yet no one said, who do you seek, or why are you talking to her? And I'm sure they were uncomfortable saying those two days in Sychar, but they were willing to do it with their Savior, with their, with their teacher. Whether we want to be or not, we are in the fields. The fields include my neighborhood, my workplace, the local McDonald's, Kroger, Piggly Wiggly, my doctor's office, the place where I get my hair cut. I read a short illustration about this. I don't know the source for this, but I thought it was very interesting. I heard Mike Reynolds, then the director of Utah Missions, at a meeting at South Carolina telling other about, telling about leading a Mormon to Christ the first time he witnessed to him. 
It was such an unusual experience for Mike that he began asking questions about others who had witnessed to the man. He then said, Something like 19 other people had witnessed to him before I did. Something like 19 other people had witnessed to him, and they may not know that he now is a believer. Something like 19 people may have been frustrated because they didn't see the results of the work that they were doing. The truth is, only God knows all the results and all of our efforts. In Galatians 6, 9, Paul says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know that after the death of Stephen, the, Jer- the Jerusalem church was scattered abroad. We know that. In Acts 8, 5, we read that Philip went to Samaria and he preached. The multitude gave heed with one accord to his message, and there was great joy there. When the church at Jerusalem heard about it, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. After that, the gospel was proclaimed in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, clearly, much of the success is traceable to the visit of Jesus to this well, the talk that he had with this woman at this well. The simple fact that the story is even there tells us how important it was. How did we get the account of what the woman and Jesus talked about? No one was there with them. It was by one of three methods. Either the Holy Spirit gave it to John, Jesus told John about it, or the people told John about it. I tend to think it's probably the last one. They were overjoyed to find the Messiah, to find someone to show them the path to salvation. 2 Corinthians 9.10, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. We have been provided the seed. It's up to us to plant it in the hearts of others, to water it, cultivate it, or to reap it when it's time. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That's Matthew 9.38. Isn't it interesting this whole event begins at a well where two thirsty people meet. Everybody is thirsty, and Jesus can quench that thirst. In Revelation 7, we read about the saints gathered around the throne of God. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. The woman went to the well that day for water, and she found someone who could wipe away her tears. He can do it for you too. He can do it for your best friend, and he can do it for your worst enemy. If, some of one, if there's someone out there who has found this sermon, may be curious about this message, I want to assure you that Jesus can give you the living waters. God can wipe away your tears. It takes a heart willing to do what he asks, willing through faith to change, to confess the authority and the power of Jesus and to allow yourself to be immersed so that that power can wash away your sins and make your soul clean before God. Let us know if we can tell you more. Let us know if we can help in your journey to find Jesus. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you very much for this morning and this opportunity to virtually be together. We thank you for the technology that's there that allows us to do it. We thank you, Father, for the message that you gave us and the woman at the well, and we thank you that the Lord loves us, that you love us, that Jesus loves us so much that he is willing to stoop down and teach each one of us. We thank you, Lord, for the people who've gone before and gave us the message, and we pray, Father, that we can take this message to others. Pray, Father, that you will bless us in all that we do. That We pray, Father, that you'll continue to move in our hearts to do your will and to do your work. And we pray, Father, for those who may be sick at this time, who may need a, a watchful eye, and we pray that you'll bless them and heal them. Pray, Father, that you'll bless us through this day and through our lives. Guide us always. And we pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. We hope that this has been an encouraging lesson for you. And... Uh, If you get a chance, read that story again. It's a great story, and you can find all kinds of little things in there. Thank you once again. Have a great Lord's Day.